Welcome to Positive Personal Power with hope, aspiration, and encouragement. Our goal is to build and enhance people's confidence and strength to handle life's challenges. Now, let me introduce you to your host, Nathaniel Skula. Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode with Marvareen Cole. Marvareen is an award-winning journalist, a broadcaster and an academic who is on the core team for the Seleni Henry Centre for Media Diversity. So welcome Marvareen. Hey, thank you so much. I'm very excited to be on the podcast. Super, super. Well, I think it's I think it's really quite fun actually because I've known you probably for, for, it's got to be about 10 years, isn't it? It is. And where's that decade gone? That's a bit scary, isn't it? But we, we met in, in the beer world, didn't we? In another world. I know. It's, it's, it's extremely strange. I, you know, I was kind of pivoting my career. And uh, today we're going to talk about the, the career pivot, emotional well-being strategies and how to navigate your career path, which right now is, is, is really tough for a lot of people. But Back then, you know, you were in beer, you were, you were broadcasting on TV and, and I was selling beer for, for a few different breweries. And, and, you know, we were kind of, we were into Twitter, right? Yeah. Yeah, we'd gone into Twitter because, I mean, Twitter was where it, at, where it was at and it, it still very much is now. So um, you were selling beer. I was a beer journalist, a beer writer. Um, I think I just won my award with the Guild of British Beer Writers. Um, and uh, I'd not long started freelancing um, as a journalist. I'd spent about four or five years at the BBC being a reporter, producer and presenter in Birmingham, my hometown, um, with the local ITV, local BBC and so on. Um, I'd spent a couple of years at Sky News because they poached me from the BBC and said, come and work for us as a news anchor. So I did that. Um, and then I think I came back to Brum for a bit um, and uh, I was interested in the kind of links between um, the history around women potentially being the um, the first ever producers of beer, you know, in, uh, God, it, 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 thousands of years ago in Sumeria. And so, <laughs> which was all really interesting to me. And I was like, no, I don't believe any of that so being the journalist I was investigating the, the history of beer pitched an idea to um, BBC Inside Out in the East Midlands and made a, a TV feature kind of looking at the history of beer and and how women were the key to the future profitability of pubs which is, for me is really interesting um, and my beer journey began and I started blogging and writing and uh, appearing on This Morning with Holly and Phil getting them drunk on beer <laughs> at 12 in the afternoon you know it was brilliant had had a lot of fun um working in the beer world um i do uh, less of that now but of course like you i still drink beer <laughs> yeah it's it once you develop that passion for for a nice beer it's it's uh, it's very very difficult uh to uh, to not because there's so many different flavors out there right absolutely there are thousands upon thousands of beers if you think about just British breweries alone, and most breweries will, will produce at least four core beers, right? So uh, a golden ale, a bitter, um, an IPA, because who doesn't love an IPA, and a stout or a porter, at least four core beers that they brew regularly. Um, and then you times that by the number of breweries you have in Britain, and then times that by the number of breweries, you know, in Europe and the world, and your beer journey could be never ending, which is, which is beautiful, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit like your career journey, really. And, <laughs> you know, it, well, it, it is. I mean, you're always, you, you know, nowadays more than ever. I mean, I was, I was listening to something the other day about how people, they actually have multiple different careers during their career, right? Like, and they learn skills all the way through. And I think, you know, that's something that um, I don't think you you probably will realize how good you are at a, a multiple of things until you find that job that you or, or, or business that you start, which you really have to use those skills for. Right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, if I think back to myself when I was a little girl. So, you know, my mum and dad came over from Jamaica um, in the 50s. Uh, my dad was a builder. My mum was a nurse. Um, 
and then uh you know my mum always loved watching the local news in the evening so i think we'd watch nick owen on um bbc news um and we'd also get the birmingham mail newspaper put through the door every night and so she would read the paper and then hand it to me and go have a look if you want so the, <laughs> you know my uh interest in news and current affairs started from that very young age um and i always felt you know drawn to tv radio broadcasting i was always just watching tv and listening to the radio um but then you know through school i didn't feel brave enough to venture into the industry so i thought oh yeah i'll try advertising you know i did a degree in business studies and i thought i'll try advertising mm-hmm. that didn't quite work out um try marketing did a couple of jobs didn't work out um and i did various jobs through my 20s where um i started a job i didn't like it i left um i started a job got made redundant you know signed on um and in the end i spent a lot of my 20s working as a secretary like a pa a personal assistant to to top you know mds and ceos um and then i had like an an epiphany when i was about i think it was about 30 and i went listen this journalism thing that you thought about when you were a kid i think you need to try it um so i went and did a, a postgraduate diploma in broadcast journalism at birmingham city university um which is where i now work so crazy full circle um and it was the best thing i ever did going back to uni um studying this postgrad learning how to become a tv and radio reporter um and i don't want to anyone to think for one minute it was just all an easy glide i didn't have the money to pay for the fees for this course right right um but i applied on a, a hunch i thought if i can get a place then i know there are bursaries available right so you had to try and get a place to apply for a bursary um so i got the place i was like one of the last 20 places for this postgrad um and then i think it was the local heart fm station the local bbc and the local itv had, were all offering bursaries for students at this uni so i applied for them all just hoping praying um had to go through like rigorous interviews for um those bursaries and in the end each broadcaster offered me a bursary which was like blew my mind um wow but that made me think it made me realize oh maybe this is a good career move for me because if broadcast has gone yeah we're going to pay your fees because we think you're you've got potential it made me believe in myself which is you know often half the battle for a lot of us right yeah yeah um yeah. and that really was the best thing i ever did you know so i kind of hustled and got my way into itv and bbc and you know worked really hard some days i worked seven days a week took extra shifts worked early mornings late nights just to kind of learn everything about the job and to and to learn in a deep fashion so that then i could be useful in all sorts of different ways um and you know i really honed my skills um at the bbc in birmingham yeah yeah i think it's very difficult though when you you know back to what you were just saying a little bit back um about your self esteem and 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 how sometimes you just need someone to perhaps believe in you to uh to encourage you to take yourself seriously like actually respect yourself right yeah do you know it, it, it that me thinking about doing the postgrad came as a result of um two periods of redundancy when i uh, you know two jobs where i was a pa i was in those those respective jobs for a year and it was made redundant um and you know you got one month salary to live on uh and when you're young in your 20s and you're you're just about in your own flat um and you got rent to pay and all the rest it's really stressful and yeah. and then um i had times where i was out of work signed on you know claimed benefit you know had my housing um checks through and stuff like that i was on um you know my electricity was on a meter that t- that time and you you know you'd watch the meter tick down and go into the emergency 5 pounds before you would you could get some money to go to the shop and top it up i've been in i've been i've lived those those times right yeah um and so it felt like me studying the postgrad was my last 
ditch attempt, you know, that big leap of faith to try something new. Yeah. Try something that I felt I had potential in, but wasn't sure. Um, and to get validated, you know, through those kind of broadcasters saying, yeah, we think we've, you've got potential. Here's a bursary was really like a, a huge, a huge change, a huge moment for me. Yeah. It's, it's really difficult. I remember once being out of work, being made redundant and actually going to the job center. And at the time, I think it was 35 pounds a week that we were receiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'll never forget. I rode my motorcycle about 20 minutes, 25 minutes to the job center in Guildford. And I parked on the pavement, but it was a really wide pavement. And I made sure I parked against this wall. Yeah. Um, and I came out and this traffic warden had given me a ticket. No. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. And the ticket was like 50 quid. Yeah. What? It, yeah. Yeah. And it put everything into perspective. It was just like, Oh no, it was just like a kick in the teeth. Right. But but that wasn't the lowest point. I think that, that I think that I think that you can you think you're at your lowest point, right? But if you haven't sort of been down to like your last can of baked beans and a and a loaf of bread with two slices left in the bag and maybe one tea bag and no milk, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I, I I think I think when that arrives, you can only go upwards from there, right? Totally. I totally appreciate what you're saying. Um, that the, the, that definitely would have been one of my lowest points. You know, the, the running down the emergency five pound on the lecky. Yeah. Um, and then going right. I, I just need to go and get five pounds to get it back to to, to zero. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes when I'm feeling, you know, low or struggling, I I, I think back to times like that. Um, and I'm always I always have gratitude. And my husband and I have gratitude because. You know, he's had tough times as well. And, yeah. you know, he had a hideous motorbike accident, uh, you know, 25 years ago. And it, it, he always remembers, you know, I'm so grateful for surviving that. Right. So we do right. often go, oh, aren't we just we're doing all right. Are we doing all right? Yeah, we're doing all right. OK, just let's let's keep on going up. Um, yeah, because life deals you some blows sometimes and it's how you how you pull yourself out of it um that is the is the real key to uh, you know a happy future yeah for sure i mean before this before this episode i sent you a message on linkedin saying we're going to talk about rocky right and rocky <laughs> the story about sylvester stallone is is that he actually sold his dog for 25 us dollars to this guy outside the liquor store right so <laughs> be serious before before he actually did rocky 1 he was trying to sell the script and every time he'd go and in New York and he would go to these to these uh, producers and he'd say, look, I've, I've got this movie. Um, uh, I want to be in it. And they would look at him and go, what do you mean you want to be in it? Like you can't even talk properly and stuff like this. Right. And and and, and one of them offered him, I think, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for his script. But he wasn't allowed to be in the movie. And he turned around. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. So eventually settled for being uh, basically uh, selling this for 35,000 and being in the movie. And they took a punt on him. And, and, and basically then he went back to the liquor store. It was the first thing he did. He went back to the liquor store three days in a row and he waited for this guy with a dog, with his dog. And he actually managed to buy the dog back from the guy. Mm -hmm. But the guy said, I want to be in your movie and I want $15,000 for the dog. Right. (laughs) And but I was just listening to this, uh, this story just before, before you came on to, uh, to uh, talk to me. And, and in fact, I think he actually slept in a bus station for three weeks. No. Was, yeah. But, you know, and, 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 and really, we're really lucky in England. I mean, it, you know, yes, there are homeless people. But if you really want to get off the streets, I think you probably can, actually. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think so too. I remember watching it. You know, the BBC have done a lot of incredible documentaries on on um, BBC Three on iPlayer about um, you know speaking day in day out, week in week out to homeless people. And I think there's there's a series of women on the streets, which is really interesting. Um, looking at you know uh, you know talking to homeless people about why they're there and if they want to get off the streets and how you know they're being helped or or not it's all relative isn't it it's it's where you perceive the help to be um, and how some kind of coped going into shelters and then not coping with the 
the regime and the regulations around living in a shelter and then being kicked out again. And, you know, it was all just so, so complex, isn't it? The, yeah. the reasons why people are homeless is so, so complex, but ultimately there are always those stories of people who have battled to get clean and, and get into accommodation and get a job and, and turn themselves around. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, but I think, but I think it, it just depends on kind of the individual, right. And what they take away from it. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm super grateful to like have a roof over my head and like to be able to eat. Right. Like, and I think there are different levels, aren't there, of, of kind of pain that you that you sort of have to go through um, to learn lessons, right? Yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, you know, when I think about, <laughs> you'd laugh at the way that my husband and I are. We're always grateful and I'll go, oh, we, we've made it to our like dream house. And that in itself was a struggle because, you know, we had, <laughs> as you do, you have, uh, first world problems of course we had credit card debts and all the rest of it and we had to pay those down to get the mortgage and and then we only had a certain mortgage because you know the times in my 20s when I had been made redundant and was um, you know on benefits and what have you I you know I ruined m my credit rating mm -hmm. so the ability to get to get a mortgage was an issue um, and then you know, I'd say, I'd say to my husband, we've got this house. It's great. And he said, yeah, yeah, we've done really well. We've paid our debts off. And I said, but we wouldn't have been able to, um, to even be here without you having bought that flat, you know, to have some equity to pay down to mortgage. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But think about where that equity came from because he was able to buy the flat from the insurance money he got because of the hideous motorbike accident. And you're like, uh... whoa, then you kind of start thinking, God, there's a lot of, weird karma going on here this terrible thing happened but out of that something you know good or be better can, can come um really really strange how the world works yeah um i am a firm believer though in um a lot of the ph philosophy that um inspirational guys like um robert holden and michael o'neill talk about in that um everything that we might look for outside of ourselves you know happiness joy resilience um you know is actually within us already innately um i'm a strong believer in that I, you know and that's one of the things that has kept me going and has kind of transformed my life and how i deal with things like in the last year I listened to a lot of Robert Holden mm -hmm. I listened to a lot of Michael O'Neill in terms of podcasts and, and books and shows wow so so yeah I mean so with emotional well-being strategies right um there are so many different different ways that you can that you can manage your emotions but before you learn to manage your emotions. You need to understand what they are, right? Yeah, absolutely. You've got to almost self-diagnose. I think it's harder if you can't self-diagnose. In the same way we know when we've eaten something and it's not agreed with us or we, we kind of sense why, oh, my knee's absolutely killing me today and that's probably because I did half an hour of a crazy Joe Wicks this morning. Do you know what I mean? You know why something's not feeling right. Yeah. And, then, and then when you feel something in your body that is, that's weird, I can't quite pinpoint it, then you almost know that, uh, yeah, maybe I should go to the doctors about this, right? So the same mm. way we do that kind of self-diagnosis around our body I think it's, you know, it would help everyone to try and do that self-diagnosis around our emotions, um, but also recognize where our feelings coming from, um, uh, you know, where our feelings, where our emotions are, are coming from. We're, all, we're always kind of, we're always experiencing our feelings. So, you know, like when um, we're worried about something that's ahead, it's kind of, we're fixating on something that's ahead, but that does not make any sense because we we can't predict the future you know so why would you get yourself completely wound up about something that you you know an imagined future um so the sooner we recognize you know those sorts of feelings um the sooner we can go well that's kind of silly right so um snap back to the present and handle each minute each hour each day as it comes 
Um, that's how I handle things. That's how I handle things now. I recognize where my feelings are coming from, what's making me sad, what's making me angry, and kind of rationalize it and go, well, particularly when, the, when there's nothing I can do about uh, a situation, mm-hmm. um, I just tell myself, there's no point in expending the energy, expending the negativity, um, winding yourself up about something that you, you have absolutely no control over. Um, I've just been able to do that. And that's, that is through the help of, like I say, listen to Robert Holden, listen to Michael O'Neill. Um, I would recommend all of that, all of those works to anybody who kind of struggles with um, emotions and, and um, you know, well-being. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, as a, as, as a, I've been doing Tai Chi like nearly 25 years. Right. So wow. for me, um, I'm very aware of my, of my emotions, but I'm also aware of how to kind of balance them and exercise diet, water and other things play a big, big part in that. But like right now it's still, it's super difficult right now because we're all stuck in, stuck indoors. Many people can't even go out for any, for any exercise without fear of bumping into someone and whatever. Right. Um, so it is, it is really, really tough, but I think I agree. I think day by day, um, just, just kind of break it down. Right. And, um, you know, you just got to, you just got to try and do your best. I mean, if you can't change something right now, then perhaps, you know, if, if you're not in work or you, you've, you've been stuck at home and you, you can't do your regular job, then think about some skills that you'd like to learn something that you really enjoy, uh, you know, look into it and study. And before you know it, you can actually be uh, very good at something. Like, I mean, I didn't know anything about podcasting like five years ago. And I just learned how to, how to edit from a friend of mine told me how to edit. And I launched a podcast and launched another one. And, uh, and then um, the world's largest ebook man, uh, producer asked me to do some expert talks for them. Uh, and I, I, I produced around a hundred talks for those guys. And, um, yeah. So, you know, you don't know where things are going to lead, but I think you need to listen to your intuition, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, all the examples you've given of how you have um, schooled yourself um, are so relevant now. We've got so much that is available online. And yes, I fully appreciate, I'm, I'm not sitting here going, uh, ha my situation's great. You know, there are loads of people, like you said, in tower blocks um, who can't, you know the parks close or whatever um you know they might have to walk how many floors to get downstairs or whatever to get fresh air yeah um i appreciate that a lot of people for for whom this lockdown is is going to be absolutely awful it is awful yeah um and i suppose the only the only suggestion the only thing i can think of um flipping back to the situation where i was you know in, in a pokey little flat uh not that nice um for four years <laughs> right mm-hmm. is do what you can, um, try and stay calm about the situation ha- and have f- hope that things will change. Um, but also try and plan if you can, um, as to how you want to change your future. Cause I do believe that we are the masters of our own fate, of our own destiny. Yeah. And like you were saying, you know, I think YouTube is the biggest encyclopedia in the world. There are so many helpful people showing you how to set up a podcast, how to use this, how to do that, how to edit yeah. this. Um, but then also there are um, organizations who are now throwing open, you know, courses that were pr- previously on paywalls, right? Free. So um, Coursera, I think, you know, or cheaper like Udemy, um, open university has got a whole load of uh, free courses, future learn. There are all these sorts of places online. And I'm sure like load more that I haven't even mentioned that people will know about where you can log on, spend hours. Boy, have we got hours now. <laughs> if you're not a key yeah. worker, we've got time. You know, if, if, if you're furloughed, you've got time, right. Yep. Um, and, and school yourself on a new topic, a new hobby um, to try and transform your life in readiness for when we do come out of however long this cycle is of us being locked down. Um, That is what I would suggest to anyone and everyone to give yourself hope, give yourself hope. Don't succumb to the hopelessness. If you can, I know I always qualify it by saying, I don't, I'm not, I'm not deliberately sounding flippant or glib, but I think, 
you know, holding on to some hope for a better future for yourself is uh, really important. Yeah. It's, it, it, but the thing is, it's about having faith, right? I mean, like whatever your belief system is, like you've got to have faith that, that things are going to get better. It's a bit like walking through a tunnel. Yeah. At the beginning of the tunnel, everything's black and you can't even see the white dot at the end at the other end. But when you get to daylight out the other side, you start you start seeing more and more of your path. And that's that's a bit like navigating your career path. Right. Which I think we should just, uh, you know, appreciate that people like yourself, people like Lenny Henry and and people from all sorts of um, races um, and uh, sexual orientation and, you know, things like this. They, they found it very, very hard uh, in life, you know. Yeah, and I think that's because obviously, you know, a lot of our institutions, a lot of our organisations have always been led by um, and managed by traditionally uh, uh, white male, privately educated um, majority. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, that's not me spouting off the top of my head. You only have to look at certain trusts, you know, kind of. Uh, detailed research around uh, the elite professions in the world you know which is basically a lot um, a lot of professions and a lot of uh, industries and institutions Um, and so you know when that's been kind of how it has been for centuries or you know kind of decades then people as our population changes and as the UK changes with people from different countries and and different ethnicities and different faiths um migrating and settling here and 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 feeling they're british um and are, they are british when they're born here it, it, it you can understand when people feel like hang on a minute so we're not represented in these circles we we're here we're living here we contribute to society we're paying taxes all the rest of it we feel british yet we're not part of um decision making we're not represented in it, it, very well in many areas then you can appreciate what people are feeling. Hang on a minute, this doesn't feel right. We need to try and affect some change so that, you know, all of those institutions that we know of uh, feel more representative, are more representative of how Britain is today. Um, yeah. And, and um, you know, so Lenny Henry's focus, of course, is television because, you know, he made it on TV at the age of 16, winning new faces in front of, what was it, upwards of 16 million people? Um, So that's his domain. It always has been. And, uh, you know, he's excelled at it, of course. Um, He's also excelled at academia, by the way, as an aside, uh, not long um, getting a PhD. Um, But so his, you know, his, the aim for the the Lenny Henry, so Lenny Henry Centre for Media Diversity at my university, um, which is Birmingham City University, is about, you know, trying to increase diversity and inclusion in in the media. with the name of kind of trying to improve policy decisions. Um, and I know some people will be like, why does that matter? Why does any of that matter? Why do we need to see more um, black, Asian, ethnic minority people on TV? Because representation really does matter. You know, um, mm. we can't kind of keep things as they are. There needs to be a shift, a more concerted shift towards a uh, fair representation. Um, and the data, you know, from Ofcom around media diversity is is very clear. Um, you know, a, a, a lower proportion of, of ethnic minority employees in senior management positions, you know, making decisions on what programs we see, we don't see, the people we see on TV or, or, or on the radio, the people behind the camera, behind the microphone, very few ethnic minorities involved in those decisions. Um, and the same when it comes to um, news and news and current affairs, we see, um, again, it's an extremely elite profession, journalism. So, um, you know, you've, you've really got to, of course, in any profession, you've got to just fight hard to, to kind of get through. But it seems that the playing field is not level. And hopefully, you know, with the work that we're doing at the centre, we'll hope to level that playing field. Um, you know, we're going to be analysing diversity statistics, examining, you know, um, where there might be deficits in the figures, but also analyse some of the, the broadcasts or sort of, sorry, the announcements made by broadcasters about what they're doing around diversity and just kind of take the temperature of the industry. Mm. 
That's very interesting. So, excuse me, I've just got a cough. <clears throat> so, when when navigating your career path, right? W- would you would you um, just look at look at an industry you want to go into, and and actually take a look at some of the real leaders in that industry, and say, well, actually. I, I could I could be there. I, I could potentially be there in five years, ten years time and or next month or next year. But like would you sort of start there and, and then and then try to navigate uh, the skills that you need to actually get to that place? Yeah, I definitely would, but I'd I'd also come from a point of as well as identifying where you think you might want to be, um make that decision based on a passion because there's no point in pursuing a career that you don't feel passionate about you know why sit and go yeah i want to be an accountant when you're kind of you know you you weren't very good with maths and you know you're thinking yeah it's going to make me a lot of money but you haven't got the the drive for it i think absolutely you've got to have a drive for a particular career um these days there's so much information out there about how to get into different careers Lots of people volunteering their own stories of their own journey. Um, lots of very transparent information about the, the qualifications you need to get there. Um, way more so than, um, you know, when I was thinking about broadcast journalism as a career, you know, coming on nearly 20 years ago, there's way more information now. Oh, yeah. And, there's, and there's masses. There's, there's loads. And so, yeah, do the research. Um, but also... You know, industries, every industry is very much built on around networking as well. Um, and there seems to be in some professions, there, there is in journalism kind of a, a unwritten rule of you've got to work your way up, which I think is fair, you know, which makes sense, particularly yeah. if you want to get to a senior position. You can't jump into a senior position of an organisation without understanding how the cogs work, you know, which bits turn which bits and who's responsible for what. You, I think it'd be very difficult for anybody to, to do that unless you know a profession. Some people might disagree. Um, but you need to school yourself on industry, um, you know, who are the main players, what sort of qualifications you need, also what sort of aptitudes and behaviours you need. You know, what sort of person do you need to to be? What sort of skills and qualities do you need to have? Um, you know, be a good listener. Um, be a good team player, be able to back down, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you, if you're trying to have an argument or a discussion and it's not working to be able to compromise, um, see other people's point of view, you know, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, it's a combination of the two. Um, but yes, yeah, buy what you want to do. Um, and then just work hard on schooling yourself about as much of the industry as you can. And ultimately, you know, getting the right qualifications to get in. um and to thrive and to grow yeah yeah i think also finding mentors as well is is superb i mean like i mean i've learned so many amazing things from people that just want to teach i mean they love just just helping people to get somewhere really it's really you know mentors is really interesting i have never had an industry mentor but i have mentored hundreds of people yeah um so i I, this feels weird yeah i've never had a mentor but then i i and I suppose that's why I, I have become a mentor in that, uh, and that people have come to me and said, I've seen you're doing this. I've seen you're, you know, you've been an anchor and now you're an academic. Can I talk to you about how I can, you know, move on in my career? And, you know, I've always loved doing that and continue to do that. Um, so, yeah, I agree. Having, me- having a mentor is super important. Um, but please don't expect that mentor to just hand you everything on a plate and go, yeah, here's no. my contact to do this. Here's my contact to do that, to do that. It's about, you know, discussing what you think you've got to offer. Um, and, and that person helping you kind of shape your future. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. And it hurts because you're going to grow because they're going to point you in the right direction. Maybe you can work on some projects and stuff together with them as well, depending on, what business you're in and um it's painful you know it's take it took me years to learn certain skills and and now those skills are coming coming uh, together now you know but um that's part of the learning journey isn't it you yeah. know yeah yeah if it doesn't hurt then generally you're probably not learning anything no pain no gain <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you've been most generous with your time. I can't thank you enough. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's been super talking with you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Really fun. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Positive Personal Power. Do subscribe via your favorite podcasting app and please leave us a five-star review. Or sign up on our website, positivepersonalpower.net for weekly emails and updates and do share our episodes with your friends and on social media. Feel free to reach out anytime.